This is a box that I keep all my treasures of Bruce's in. Cards that he's given me. Little a things. box full of memories. This is from when he was really teeny. Yeah. Eight. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> from her eldest, Bruce. Mother's Day cards and little notes he's written over the years. Must be still tough going through this. Eh? It is, it really is. Because he was very sentimental. Yeah, so. you can see that. Happier times. Every week I put fresh flowers here for him. Before the tragedy that took his life. He was very rambunctious. He had been diagnosed when he was little with ADHD and a mild form of Tourette's, so he liked to act out in school, but he was a very good natured, but he, he was like his dad, pulled a lot of pranks, got in, uh, it went to the office a lot, but he had a big heart. One of my favorite stories about uh, how he had this uncanny ability to nail things was he was three and a half or four, we were right up in front of the house playing street hockey. And like any father, I was telling him, this is how you hold the stick, this is how you stick handle, this is how you shoot, this is how you do whatever. And he pretty soon had had it with me and looked at me and said, you know, Dad, if you know so much about it, you should be doing it, not just talking about it. <laughs> you may recognize Scott. It's 2-1 after one and with the goal scorer for the Kings. For close to three decades, he's been one of the voices of CBC Sports, from Hockey Night in Canada to the Olympics. For Canada and the Olympic regatta because... But he was always based in Winnipeg. Probably! Where his boys, Darcy and Bruce, the oldest... Maybe I could have that one and he could have this one... ...were growing up. From a young age, Darcy dreamed of being a magician. Ready? Okay. Bruce was a natural athlete. A member of the boxing team for the Canada Games but in Bruce's late teens, something started to change. We were naive parents. I did know that he had been, you know, smoking marijuana, um, and, but I, we didn't think it had really progressed any further. He graduated from high school. He was on the varsity basketball team. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but I guess it uh, over time evolved into uh, crystal meth and ecstasy at weekend parties or whatever. And uh, given his ADHD diagnosis, which made him, as Ann says, adventurous and up for anything, it wasn't uh, a giant leap from that into opiates. By the time he was 22, unknown to Bruce's parents, things were spiraling out of control. They were on vacation in Nova Scotia when he called. He said, I'm in trouble. and. Um, he said, I'm not a junkie, but I have a problem. He'd been assaulted he, yeah. over a drug debt. So he turned his to his parents. His hand was and broken, yeah. We got home, and we hadn't seen him for a couple of weeks at that point. And uh, when we got home and got a look at him, we knew right he away that he was in, in, uh, very bad, in shape. bad shape and that uh, there was a, a problem bigger than what we had imagined. What he was letting imagined. on, yeah. even. His addiction had progressed to heroin. What followed was three and a half years, hundreds of thousands of dollars of trying to get him treatment, a cycle of limited success and relapse. He went to rehab four times and he was in and out of detox about eight times. So you have to go to detox before you can get into rehab. But he'd think, oh, I go to detox and I'll clean myself up and then I, I can do it myself, but he never could. But whenever we forced the issue with him, uh, we'd say, you need to go to rehab. Um, he went. He would go. Every time. And what did that tell you? It told us that, well, we thought he wanted a better life, and, and we still believe that. But more than anything. He wanted to please us. Yeah. Wanted to... Uh, he wanted to make his parents happy. Yeah. By 2011, he was living in Calgary, had a good job, an apartment, and a girlfriend, and seemed to be having success with treatment at a local facility. This was his fourth attempt at rehab, 
Uh, and when he went the second time, we thought this is when he gets it right because he had some success there previously. Um, so we had great hope. We always had hope when he was in rehab. We are like a lot of parents, you know, when uh, you always want to know that your kids are safe. Uh, Stan always says you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. Um, so, you know, we, we had the most comforting nights of our lives were when we knew he was safe and when he was in rehab. But once again, tragically, he slipped. He was shooting up heroin in his girlfriend's apartment and she called 911 because he was kind of, I guess, not very lucid. They tried to convince him to go to the hospital with them. He wouldn't go and so they left and he, he wanted to shoot up one more time. She said, you can't do it here, you have to get out. He left her apartment and walked up to a bar at the end of the street, walked right into the bathroom, shot up the rest of the heroin, and just hit the floor and died. Six years later, it's still as raw as it ever was. Never goes away. Even bringing out all the stuff to show you, you know, it's... I found some report cards and his boxing medals and... Yeah. Well, you know, you have holes in your hearts that will never heal. That describes Ann and I and Darcy perfectly. But, um, you know, we... Uh, we miss him every day, but we, you know, you go on. They decided right from the moment they wrote his obituary to start a conversation. We decided that we would put in the obit exactly what claimed his life. Mm -hmm. Right at the beginning, not at the end. Yeah, uh, because we weren't going to hide behind it. They know they are not alone. Every day in a paper or online somewhere in Canada, there's another picture of a young person who has died from an overdose. Tens of thousands a year. There is a crying need for a long-term treatment centre uh, where we live in Winnipeg and around Winnipeg that addicts have access to and no one is turned away because they can't afford to pay. I mean, that's the key. Mm -hmm. um, we are, in a lot of ways right now, leaving a generation of addicts out there to die. Instead of becoming lost in their grief, they started a foundation in Bruce's name, started raising money for a treatment facility. And this truly is a family affair. It comes in waves, I guess. There's like... Different emotions sort of hit you at different times. And different Younger like, brother Darcy has been hurting for six years too. He and his older brother were tight, very tight. We were two years apart, super close, exact same sense of humor. It's like living with a brick in your pocket, but the weight never goes away. You just get used to it being there. Yeah. You know, and yeah, every so often you put your hand in your pocket and you're like, oh yeah, there there's is. the brick. Yeah. Yeah. Darcy got Darcy lost in his work and now, thanks to appearances on programs like Britain's Got Talent, has become world famous as an illusionist. Just uh, show the camera there. Uh, He's very good at what he does. Some of them were face down, some of them were face up, some of them were yep. face down. We had backs to fronts, fronts to backs, faces to faces. But watch, didn't matter. All I had to do was give the deck a little shake like that. Yep. His card, your card rather, jumps to the bottom. Two of spades. Uh, no. And he's using it to help raise money for his brother's foundation. Yeah. What was your card? It was the Queen of Clubs. Queen of Clubs, watch. All we have to do is go back in time to the beginning of the trick where all the cards are back to normal. <laughs> and you pulled out, take a look. <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> there you go. Wow. Initially, two nights were booked for this theater. Now it's four. Just think, you're filling this place four times over in your, in your brother's memory. How's that feel? That feels really good, actually, yeah. When, when you put it that way, that uh, makes it more meaningful than just doing a regular show, right? Yeah, uh, you'd be pretty proud of you, I'd yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Uh... 
All the proceeds, which could be as much as half a million dollars, will go to the project. We just got this and we're very excited about it. And the dream is getting closer. A 50-bed facility available to any addict free of charge. They hope the final fundraising push will make it a reality in Bruce's memory. He was about more than his addiction. Uh, when we tell Bruce's story in public, we tell uh, people what he was like as a kid, just as we did here earlier. Uh, but, you know, addiction claimed his life, and our, our thought is if something good can, could come out of something so tragic, it would be a beautiful thing. This is the last picture they have of him, the way they want to remember him, at the family cottage with a big grin on his face. Red Sharon, CBC News, Winnipeg.